On Zuko's ship, you can see him writing in his journal, and he has a bunch of small totems of past avatars that begin to glow once Aang comes out of the ice. This is very strange. You could argue that it's a plot hole in the original show that all of the past avatar temples and shrines weren't glowing it up for the past hundred years while Aang was in the ice, since he was in the avatar state the entire time after all and they only started doing so when he went into the Avatar state after he was unfrozen. But now there's a new plot hole coming that we're going to see very soon as a result of the confirmation that the triggering of the Avatar state still causes this reaction in even the most basic of totems. And we know the temples, including Roku's and the Fire Nation, are still populated as of later episodes. Now a lot of what I've been saying has been negative so far, and that will continue. However, I must say that Zuko's casting is absolutely flawless. There's even some line deliveries where he almost sounds like Dante Bosco. This new actor, Dallas Liu, Liu, oh no, is putting everything into the performance. However, as good as his performance is, I can't ignore the dialogue that a classically trained actor couldn't deliver without sounding clunky. Prince Zuko, I don't think your father would want you. My father has banished me until I find the Avatar, and that's exactly what I'll do. Something I'm noticing with this show is that almost everything needs to be exposited as soon as the opportunity arises, rather than through some natural conversation. Like, what is Iroh going to say about what Zuko's father would want here? I don't think your father would want you to, what? stress about finding the Avatar? Work yourself to the bone over this? Eh, I mean, that makes sense. Ozai clearly cares a lot about Zuko's well-being. So even though this is a line coming from Iroh that makes no sense for him to say and comes out of nowhere, it's necessary to get Zuko to exposit that he's been banished until he captures the Avatar because of the mission given to him by Ozai. Also, this has nothing to do with the writing, but Zuko's scar makeup is pretty pathetic and doesn't sell his disfigurement nearly enough. It's not quite as bad as the M. Night movie since that shit was barely even noticeable, but it's still not great. Am I saying the actor should have shaved his eyebrow every single day because it's impossible for hair follicles to grow back over burned scar tissue? I mean, if Aang's actor had to shave his head every day, then I don't know, maybe. The least you could do is have a prosthetic or something. This is just makeup meant to look like a scar. I thought you were playing Zuko, not a Mon. And now in the original show, we not only had a small scene of Aang talking with Katara and Sokka on the way back to the village, but once they were there, Aang woke up from a nightmare detailing how he crashed into the ocean and became trapped in the ice. This was a super small, short sequence that gave us the needed information on how we got into the iceberg without giving us all the context. Mostly because that context was being saved for later for some reason that's probably not very important. Now, even though we just got all the context for how he got into the ice a few minutes ago, we still get the same nightmare sequence that wakes him up in the village. This was not needed. This is a case where deviating from the original show would actually be a benefit since this is now redundant information due to the change in narrative order. Just have him suddenly wake up if you're gonna do this. You just had the scene with Zuko, have him give some big, passionately angry line about how he will capture the Avatar, and then quickly cut to Aang waking up in shock as the line echoes in the background. Boom. Easiest fix in the world. Katara is also not even present when Aang wakes up or finally introduces himself. For some reason, he only gets to introduce himself to Sokka. Then Katara just kind of shows up afterward. This is another thing even the movie at least tried with, even though it did the same thing with him mostly waking up in the village first. Here though, Aang and Katara won't even share dialogue for several more scenes when their fast friendship was what ended up propelling so much of the narrative and characterization of the opening to the original show. If Katara doesn't form such a strong attachment to Aang, then it means a lot less when she chooses to leave home to rescue him and travel the world with him. This Katara would never say she's going to leave home and willingly exile herself with Aang even for a second. But don't worry. I'm sure the bonding scenes they'll have eventually in this episode will be great. So Aang wakes up, causes a commotion, summons Appa with the bison whistle that he has from the start now. Appa shows up and he just flies right away now. And we saw like 60 sky bison earlier in the episode flying all at once, so there's no reveal now. No character moment for Sokka, that's cool. Because Aang has basically no context for who got him out of the ice or really what happened to him, it creates a large disconnect between himself and his supposed new friends. The first scene he's actually awake with Katara and Sokka present, he's just looking for Appa. These two don't mean anything to him, who even are they? They're certainly not the characters I know and love, that's for sure. Okay, then Aang is inside the, I guess, town hall, explaining to the entire town what happened to him. And thankfully, most of it is explained off screen, 
Even though I wouldn't put it past this show to explain something that we are in. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Yeah, see, like that. I think basically everyone hates this scene, including the people who like the show. I hate this for multiple reasons. Not the least of which is that almost all of this was dialogue that Katara used to have that's now being poached by Grand Grand for basically no reason, further creating a rift between the protagonists. The reveal that Aang's been frozen for a hundred years was originally a Katara and Aang scene. The whole intro was narrated by Katara. The only real line here that was Grand Grand's was how airbenders haven't been seen in a hundred years. Also, when Katara dropped the bombshell on Aang that he'd been frozen for a century, she was immediately there to comfort him. But now Grand Grand just tells him what's up and he runs outside while everyone just stares at him, Katara included. Someone on the writing staff did not like Katara because they didn't give her shit to work with. Did my sister write this? I hope that doesn't mean they're going to go for Zutara. Oh no. Speaking of Zuko, he gives a quick speech to his men that doesn't amount to much. You could easily cut this scene. The only purpose it serves is introducing us to his lieutenant, G, who is a bit more important in this show than he was in the original, where he mostly just served as a small plot device to help explain Zuko's backstory in the storm, and give Zuko a small redemption arc contained within that episode. Now, he serves basically the same purpose, but spread out over more time, I guess. But there's a little more to it. I'm sure they won't find a way to ruin the one aspect of the show that most people claim is genuinely great and an improvement over the original. Anyway, 35 minutes in, Katara finally says a line to Aang. This took about seven and a half minutes in the original show, and even less time in the movie, actually. And of course, if you remove the intros, then it's even less time. For context, we've been in the Southern Water Tribe for about 15 minutes now. But of course, because we've wasted so much time on random garbage we didn't need to see, can you guess what Aang and Katara's first conversation is? You got it, partner. It's that exposition, baby. I don't need to tell you that in the original show, it was way more natural. Katara doesn't even tell Aang about what happened to her mother until the Southern Air Temple. It's a rough memory for her, and one she only feels comfortable divulging after knowing Aang for some time, instead of being basically the first thing she says to him. But she needs to say it here to bring Aang down to Earth, and explain just how ruthless the Fire Nation is in a way that hits close to home. Again, this is all information that Aang needs to hear, and it gives context to not only Katara's character, but the state of the world to both Aang and the audience in a way that feels natural and brings the characters closer together. Now, Katara notices that Aang is bummed out because all of his friends are now a hundred years in the past, and so she just dumps her backstory on him because she's trying to empathize with him, explaining that she knows what loss is like too. It's not the worst example of exposition, but it's still pretty clunky and not very good. More of the same problem of things needing to be exposited as quickly as possible. We're not adapting that scene from the Southern Air Temple, so it all gets shoved into this one conversation. It's especially bad when Katara just flat out says that she and Sokka had to grow up fast, and that's not something we get to figure out for ourselves. There's a really great quick little line in the original when Katara is penguin sledding with Aang. She says that she hasn't done this since she was a kid, and Aang is quick to point out that she still is a kid. Katara's only 14, but she doesn't view herself as a kid anymore because of all the responsibility she's had to take on and everything that she's had to go through. And that's explained to the audience in a way that isn't insultingly blunt and agonizingly dry. The next scene we get is a strange one. It's the scene where Zuko is practicing his drills on his ship, and I'd say it's strange mostly because of Iroh's vibe. He's all off in this scene in particular. In the original show, Iroh was pretty laid back about this whole mission and didn't take Zuko's concerns about finding the Avatar all that seriously. He saw it as the wild goose chase it was and didn't think it was ever going to happen. He just wanted to be there for his nephew. You get the vibe that this is a routine they've gone through quite a few times. Iroh even mentions that they've been through this area before and found nothing. But when it comes to Zuko's drills, he actually takes it pretty seriously. He's grilling Zuko to master his basics, probably because he knows on the off chance that they do find the Avatar, or just need to defend themselves in general, Zuko needs to be at the top of his game. During the drilling sequence here, Iroh doesn't seem to care all that much. He's just like, yeah, that's pretty good, let's go eat. Hey Iroh, this is your nephew who you love like a son? If there's even a chance that he's going up against the most powerful person in the world, please treat it like that's the case. The performance that Iroh gives here almost reminds you of the original idea for Iroh before Aaron Iha swooped in and basically saved the entire show. He was originally going to be yet another evil family member of Zuko's who purposefully trained Zuko wrong and would come to betray him in the end. 
That's not the direction they've gone with this character, thank fucking god. But the actor's performance here is giving me those vibes. He kinda just seems like he doesn't really give a shit about anything. Also, in the original, Zuko was struggling with his basics because of his impatience. But now he's apparently in peak form, which says what to the audience? That he's a really good firebender, I guess. Not much to glean from that in terms of character, unlike the original. And then we get to one of my least favorite scenes in the whole episode, and that's saying a lot. Hey, so you know how I was praising the show earlier for making it so Katara was even more of a novice than she was in the original show? Well, Aang gives a platitude about energy and balance. Feel the energy, feel the balance. Feel the balance. Feel the energy. It's basically completely meaningless, but apparently it's enough to graduate Katara from pre-novice to actually competent waterbender. I hate this idea that some basic platitude can apply to all bending. In the original show, every single element had its core traits that made them unique. Different stances, techniques, sources of power. Anyone who watched the original show can tell you how the different styles of bending worked because there was a lot of time devoted to explaining them. Airbending is all about avoiding and evading combat, as Boomy mentions in his duel with Aang. Waterbending is about push and pull, redirection, using your opponent's strength against them. There's a super quick example of this in Katara's duel with one of Paku's students, where she waits for him to make a move, then punishes him with it. And it's the basis for Iroh's lightning redirection technique. Earthbending is about stubbornness and patience. Toph mastered the element through the mastery of waiting and listening, and with her general stubborn attitude. All this talk that Aang is making about energy sounds more like firebending teachings. That's the term most commonly used to describe firebending. The energy of the sun, the energy generated through breath, and even the energies being separated and crashed back together to generate lightning. But the real bitch of all of this is that bending has its roots in real martial arts. You can't platitude your way into teaching someone kung fu. Master Shifu can't just tell Po to feel the energy around him, he has to put it into practical application that he'll understand. That's why you have to learn from a bending master. For the same reason that you have to learn from your karate teacher before your dad shoots him in the head at the airport. In fact, this is actually something that comes up in the original unaired pilot, but it was understandably cut from the final show. There's a similar scene like this where Aang says some shit about energy and legwork and applies it universally to all bending while Katara is practicing. And then later, she uses that extremely broad advice to save herself and Sokka. Katara and Sokka are also weirdly distant and kind of cold to Aang and the pilot, just like how they are in this show, which honestly makes me feel like the showrunners used the pilot as a baseline rather than the original show itself. Now you may be thinking I'm overreacting. After all, she just made a ball of water. That's not a big deal. And I'd still say I'm correct in my indignation towards this scene because one, this should not work under any circumstances. Two, when Aang gave Katara a platitude about being a bender in the equivalent to this scene in the original show, it ended terribly for them. Three, you're gonna see very soon that Katara's competence extends far beyond just making a mermaid man and barnacle boy water ball, and four, fuck you, I wanna complain. Okay, so Zuko's ship is arriving. Good, I hope he kills everyone. Also, the costume designs are usually pretty good, but what the fuck is this armor that Sokka's wearing? What is that, leather ringlet armor? Anyway, that aside, Gran Gran, through nothing but the power of the vibe check, manages to suss out the fact that Aang is the Avatar. Originally, this was a reveal that Zuko gave everyone. He knew he was looking for the last airbender, and when he finds that airbender, he comes to the conclusion it must be the Avatar. Aang doesn't even get a chance to lie about it like he did originally, because he's barely managed to get a word in edgewise to this goddamn exposition. Also, Grand Grand, bad timing, we're in the middle of a siege. Sokka blowing up on Aang here is super weird. He freaked out in the old show because Aang's tomfoolery sent a big glowing beam and then a flare up, and the next thing you know, a fire navy ship is on the doorstep. That looks really fucking bad for Aang. So now, we need Grand Grand to vibe check Aang here because we cut out that conflict based on characterization and now need something based on what this episode does best. Exposition. Well, here comes Zuko. No more busting down the pathetic walls of your rinky-dink village, throwing fire into the crowds and threatening the elderly. He politely walks up to the gate and asks nicely for them to surrender the Avatar. We have no desire to take your homes. We merely seek someone who does not belong here. Someone who is not one of you. Oh god, not you too, Zuko. So much like Katara and Sokka have had their edges smoothed off to be much more consumable, we have the same thing happening with Zuko. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain this, but Zuko's redemption arc was not effective because he was always a nice guy. Zuko 
for the vast majority of the first season, is a massive dick and an outright villain. He's even rude to his uncle, who's the only person who shows him unconditional affection. I think you are exactly what you seem. A lazy, mistrustful, shallow old man who's always been jealous of his brother. Most of his development doesn't happen until the second season. But what makes him compelling is his complexity, the reasoning and history behind all of his actions, and what makes him at least a bit sympathetic, despite his status as a villain, is his greater status as an underdog in basically every situation he finds himself in. He's pretty hopelessly outmatched against Aang, with their first encounter almost destroying his ship. Zhao and Azula have far more power, resources, and more importantly, freedom than he does. If they wanted to, they could stop looking for the Avatar and focus on their own shit, but he can never do that. Iroh says that all the previous Fire Lords tried and failed to find the Avatar, but they had the option to just go back home when they did. Something Zuko doesn't have. So yeah, we have a completely defanged and smoothed out Prince Shut Your Mouth You Water Tribe Peasant Zuko being kind and respectful to these people the old Zuko would scarcely tolerate. A narrative choice that will make his inevitable redemption feel far less satisfying because now it's less like a genuinely bad person changing and growing over time to better themselves and more like a good guy just finally admitting that he's good. I have to wonder how the fuck they will possibly justify Zuko siding with Azula during the season 2 finale. Then again I have to wonder how they're gonna do a lot of shit with season 2. And hey, you might think it's an overreaction now to say this but we'll see. Sokka gets ready to turn Aang over to Zuko because, yeah, he barely knows the kid, why wouldn't he turn him over? But Katara gets all defensive about it, and I honestly think it might just be because he helped her waterbend, because there is literally nothing else there. Maybe with a handful more sentences about energy and balance, she'll be able to defeat Paku in her duel with him. Sokka, don't you see? He's the Avatar! And he lied to us about it! Uh, Sokka, no, he didn't. Cartoon Aang lied about it. Right to Katara's face, no less. This Aang has barely gotten a chance to speak. Unless you count the story that Aang told in the town hall, in which case I would say that cutting out the part where Aang lies about being the Avatar is a pretty massive fault on the part of the writers. But hey, if they didn't keep changing shit for no good reason, and kept things like they were in the cartoon, I wouldn't be having these complaints. So despite sharing a handful of words with the guy, Katara decides she's going to be trying out for the Ember Island players and gives a long-winded, overly emotional speech about hope. This is the first of many disturbing similarities. We waste a bit more time by having Sokka challenge Zuko to a duel. Lieutenant G says this is pointless, which it is, but Zuko wants the street cred and the fight is over basically instantly. In the cartoon, this was a super quick scene basically played for laughs and Sokka was hopelessly outmatched against Zuko. It showed that Sokka was full of hot air and not the warrior he claimed to be when put up against an actual threat. Something that made his eventual growth into an actual warrior extremely satisfying, mind you. But now we need this weird dual preamble that adds nothing to the scene. The same is true for the subsequent sequence of the Water Tribe fighting back against Zuko and his crew. It lasts for a couple seconds, adds nothing to the scene, and ends the same way it did in the cartoon, with Aang surrendering himself to Zuko. It just took longer for no reason. Also, Zuko agreeing to leave everyone alone originally was a surprising act of mercy, but now it's just what he wanted to do anyway until they fought back. You can make a genuine case that Zuko didn't even do much wrong here, and only wanted to start attacking in self-defense. This will not be the last time this happens. The changes and additions here aren't accomplishing anything in the narrative. They're not necessary concessions for the medium change, it's just for the sake of being different and always worse. Also, Aang's line of no one has ever fought from it before rings a little hollow when, like... And for some reason, Aang's big moment is with Sokka and not Katara, even though they've spent even less time together. And I guess Sokka's arc for this episode is done because he learned a lesson about bravery and leadership or something? Being a leader means protecting the people who can't protect themselves, which is what Aang is doing right now, not Sokka. Aang could defend himself just fine, and he's using his position as the primary target of Zuko to protect people who can't protect themselves otherwise. And this is the lesson that Sokka gets out of it because he had a hackneyed 5 second duel with Zuko? This is just amateurish. And I can only repeat myself so many times that the friendship between these three doesn't feel earned at all. In the original, Aang and Katara had gotten so close in such a short amount of time that Sokka jokingly called Aang her boyfriend. Which he, uh, doesn't here. Instead of, we're going to save your boyfriend, 
it's now, let's go save that weird kid. In fact, there's been no hinting at an Aang and Katara romance at all. You wouldn't fucking dare. So Aang gets imprisoned on Zuko's ship. We sadly don't get to see the shot where his smile fades as soon as he's sure Katara can't see him anymore, which is a really great one. And Iroh approaches his cell, kind of in disbelief that this is even real. And I actually kind of like Aang's conversation with Iroh here. Iroh was sufficiently well-spoken, and Aang saw through that he didn't really believe in the Fire Nation dogma, and Aang's question on how the war even started was reasonable as a start, since it's something he doesn't have context for. See, I'm fine with exposition when it's called for and character traits are revealed, which they are for Iroh in this scene. I especially like that Iroh doesn't give a straight answer to Aang's question about if he believes in what the Fire Nation believes. The show is allowed for just a brief moment to let a question hang in the air. For new viewers, this will be a hint towards Iroh's true nature that doesn't give away the whole farm immediately by just expositing exactly how he feels on the matter in a long, detailed, and extremely dry dump of his backstory. Is that what you believe? Actually, no. I was disenfranchised with the Fire Nation's war efforts after the death of my son Lu Ten during my siege on the city of Ba Sing Se. Ever since then, I've taken in Prince Zuko as my surrogate son ever since his father banished and scarred him, and I am working to steer him onto the path of good, though getting through to him can certainly be a test of patience. I, however, believe there is still good in him. Oh, I see. So good job! A worthwhile addition! The first one. Only one so far. However, then Aang basically uses the Force to steal this guard's keys, which the guard clearly notices. He basically sees it, and it makes a pretty loud noise. But he needs to be an imbecile so Aang can escape. In the cartoon, Aang correctly ascertained that the soldiers had never fought an airbender before, and would have no idea how to do so and struck at a critical moment when one guard was fully occupied. Maybe it can make his escape feel a bit too fast, but it was done in a decently smart way that makes it so you can't blame the soldiers too much for not being able to stop him. Oh god, and then there's this scene. I really love the cartoon version of this scene. Sokka's initial dry, sarcastic delivery of his lines is utterly fantastic, and it's refreshing to see him genuinely enthusiastic once Appa takes to the sky. So what do we get now? <laughs> you're not serious. Katara, no! There's a no way you're getting me on that- A very Marvel-esque Gilligan cut in 2024. Man, this is a joke that's so played out that Family Guy was subverting it back in its second season. Forget it, Death. I'm not gonna do your dirty work. There's no way I'm getting on that plane. Absolutely no way. And that's final. See? I'm still here. And there's nothing you can say that'll change my mind. Either you kill them or I kill you. Oh, crap. So Aang's out of his cell now. He goes into Zuko's quarters to find, I'm assuming, his staff, even though it kind of just seems like an afterthought to him for most of the scene. Also, he can just fly without it now. But the main thing is he finds Zuko's journal of all the past avatars. I don't even know why Zuko has this, to be honest. I mean, you're hunting for the avatar. It makes sense to do your research, I guess. But I feel like recognizing that each avatar is so different from the last would make that kind of a futile effort. Like, what would learning about Kiyoshi teach you about Aang? Only the most fundamental basics of the Avatar. Like knowing all four elements and the ability to enter the Avatar state. Because as individuals, they couldn't be more different. But you didn't really kill Shin. Technically, he fell to his own doom because he was too stubborn to get out of the way. Personally, I don't really see the difference. So Aang steals the book wholesale, which is an odd choice. I say this because you would think if he steals the entire book, instead of just reading a particularly plot-critical passage at this time, then all of the contents of the book would come into play later in the season. Uh, they don't. Literally two things about this book matter. The location of Kiyoshi Island, and the fact that the Avatar is able to enter the Avatar state. You could easily put both of those pieces of information on the same page that Aang happens to read, especially considering that Kiyoshi created her island with the raw power of the Avatar state. Have Aang read a little section of it aloud, and maybe have some cool visuals kind of like the painting style used for the Cave of Two Lover story, something like that. Either that or just flashback to Kiyoshi's actual actress doing it. And look, this isn't a big thing, right? He took a book, big fucking deal. But that's kind of my point. This is such an innocuous thing, and yet they keep bringing it up like it's actually important long after it served its narrative purpose, which it does by as early as the beginning of the following episode. I'll point out the examples as they come. Aang's escape in general is also pretty bizarre. He goes outside and is all Metal Gear Solid about it when he was literally a hop, skip, and a jump away from being home free with a single glide. Cartoon Aang was basically in the air as soon as he was out the door. 
only getting stopped by Zuko's near suicidal jump. Also, Aang first encountered Zuko in his quarters in the original show, which made sense. They were his quarters. Now, Zuko is just on deck for some reason. There hasn't even been any indication of Aang's escape. It's like he teleported there at the most plot-critical moment. Anyway, Aang finally takes off, but they shoot him down from the sky, which, yeah, Zuko's choreography just looks kinda goofy here. And oh no, Aang is now free-falling. It sure would be a shame if some earlier scenes established that he can just fly now. That might suck all the tension out of this scene. But hey, Sokka saves him. His arm is probably irreparably maimed in the process, but good for you, Sokka. Way to stand up for the little guy. That's your arc, I guess, right? So Zuko tries to shoot him down again, and in the cartoon, Aang deflected the fireball into a nearby glacier, which caused the ice to crash down and heavily damage Zuko's ship, completely halting their pursuit. Now, though, Katara bends a water ball up from like 200 feet below them in order to extinguish the fireball. I don't seem to recall taking up smoking crack, but that seems to be the only explanation for this absolute jiggery fucking pokery. After a couple of sentences, she went from barely being able to manipulate water at all to pulling off this shit. We also don't get to see Aang go into the Avatar state and fight off Zuko and his crew with the first serious water bending we see in the show due to the new structure of the scene, but maybe they're trying to cover up another potential plot hole? After all, in the Southern Air Temple when Aang goes into the Avatar state, that's when knowledge of the Avatar's return goes public, even though he went into the Avatar state during this fight on the ship. Maybe no one was at any of the Avatar temples and shrines during that time, it wasn't all that long of a fight, maybe a few seconds, so it's plausible, but you could argue that people should have figured it out then. I could easily see that going either way, but if it is a plot hole, it's one resolved by the very next episode, so eh, who really cares? The real curiosity here is that Zuko's ship is now undamaged, which is very odd. The whole reason Zhao figures Zuko out is because the damage to his ship is very suspicious and it spurs him to investigate. Now, you've left Zhao with no choice but to pick up where Grand Grand left off, and discover the truth about the Avatar through the power of pure vibes. Shao on that Grand Grand wavelength. They did the same thing in the movie too, by the way. No Avatar stay from Aang and Zuko's ship is undamaged, meaning Zhao just inserts himself into the story with a lot less reasoning behind it. So there's a super quick conversation as they're flying around on Appa, escaping Zuko. Not much of substance, just, hey, the Fire Nation is going to keep looking for you and we can't go home because that's one of the first places they'll look. So where do we go from here? And it's a smash cut straight to the Southern Air Temple. Paying any attention to the time code will tell you we're almost at the end of the episode. And after somehow stretching out and gutting the first two episodes and half of the storm over the course of an hour, we're now hyper condensing the Southern Air Temple into a couple of minutes. It's incredibly rushed. Just boom, now we're here. There's the Fire Nation helmet proving that the Fire Nation was here. There's Gyasu's corpse, now start glowing it up. I genuinely think that the movie, as rushed as its pacing was, actually managed to spend more time in this area. It's also pretty odd that Aang gets as upset as he does, considering the whole reason he went into the Avatar state to begin with in the cartoon was because it came as a shock to him. He didn't know for certain that firebenders were at the temple, and he originally found Gyatso by complete accident. Again, even the goddamn movie got this part right. In this version, he seems to know exactly what he's going to find, but still loses control of himself. And the fact that he does seem to know what he's going to find makes this question why he's even here to begin with. What, to confirm that the genocide you now already know about actually happened? Aang isn't in denial like he was in the cartoon. It's just something that's going to upset him and wow, look at that, it does. Also, the conversation we had that led us here is that we can't go home because the Fire Nation will find us there. So where do we go from here? How about the next possible location they would end up looking? The former home of the Avatar. Zuko's ship has not been damaged. There's no time buffer for them to putz around here. In the original show, Zuko's ship was docked this whole episode, so even if he was going to look for them there, they would have been long gone by the time his ship was fixed. Of course, the reason we're here is that we need Aang to go into the Avatar state, because that's what's going to drive the plot forward. That's an odd statement to anyone who's seen the original show, but it'll make a bit more sense in the next episode. And now that we're at this point in the Southern Air Temple plot, we come to a very obvious problem. Aang has absolutely no relationship with these two goobers, so how can Katara possibly talk him down out of the Avatar state? Uh, she can't, so she won't. And it's a good thing too, because at this point, if Katara gave Aang the line about how she and Sokka are Aang's new family, it would be completely unearned and out of place. 
and the only thing it would earn is some laughs from the audience. Like, bitch, you're family now? Since the fuck when? I believe it more from movie Katara, and she didn't have nearly as much time code as you've had. So instead, Aang has flashbacks to Gyatso being a cool dude, and that chills him out. Thinking about Gyatso is what got him so angry he went into the Avatar state, but thinking about Gyatso again is what brings him down from it, even though he died horribly and you'll never see him again. You could easily make the case that thinking about Gyatso would only make things worse. This whole thing has pretty major implications because they just cut out far too much and had to go for an option that made more sense in the short term, but is damaging in the long term. Katara is able to talk Aang out of his rage in the cartoon, and this reinforces their relationship, as well as coming back to play in the desert when Aang loses control again. This time, she's able to do it completely non-verbally with just a hug, because the power of friendship is fucking awesome, man! If they even do that story in the future, which is a big if considering I sincerely doubt they're adapting the library, which you might think is stupid, but just you wait and see, do you think Aang will just think really hard about Appa and that will calm him down? I mean, hey, by that point, Aang and Katara will probably have shared like maybe 10 more lines with each other. By that point, I'm sure they'll practically be family. Like a brother. I wouldn't want it any other way. If you're watching this show alone, you'll probably be under the impression that the most important relationship Aang has is with Gyatso, not Katara. And you'd be correct. And later episodes reinforce this. And you might be saying, later episodes? But Gyatso is dead. How could they possibly give him even more screen time? Well! Now obviously in this episode, a huge chunk of time is spent with Aang and Gyatso's relationship, so it feels pretty biased in that regard, since so much of Katara and Sokka's segment was devoted to exposition instead of characterization and the building of their relationships. But in later episodes, pretty much everyone spends the whole time separated once they arrive at their particular destination, because they cram so many episodes together that everyone is busy doing their own plot from one of these episodes and can't just hang out with each other. First impressions are so incredibly important, and we've just spent this first impression establishing that Aang's relationship with the two people he's going to be spending the most time with, or at least is in the same general location as for most of the time, takes second place to his relationship with Gyatso, someone who dies in the first 20 minutes of the show. Just for kicks, I decided to see how much dialogue was shared between characters in this episode. I was especially generous and counted times when Aang was talking in the general direction of Sokka and Katara as lines to both of them. And boy, for how much talking there is in this episode, there's really not a whole hell of a lot of actual dialogue, especially between the main characters. For one thing, yeah, Aang has more dialogue with Gyatso than he does with Sokka in the entire episode. The amount of dialogue Katara shares with Aang just barely scrapes out past Gyatso's until the very end of the episode. And even then, the bulk of what's said is just Aang giving a monologue that's mostly to the audience more so than to anyone in particular. But I counted it as being said towards both siblings anyway, because they fucking need it! And it did a lot of legwork for making it seem like these people actually talk to each other. What stuck out to me is that until his final speech, Aang doesn't really get to talk much in dialogue. It's mostly just quick responses to what's being told at him whenever he has to listen to another exposition dump. Hey Aang, here's my long and elaborate backstory about death, destruction, war, loss, pain, anguish. It was really brutal, man. Wow. That sounds like it sucked. It did suck, Aang. It did suck. I think ultimately, this is a big part of why it's so hard to buy their friendship. Aang got to pal around with them in his original introduction, and they bounced off each other really well. Another thing is, there's plenty of scenes and instances where one or more parties will stay mostly silent or only have a word or two. If Katara doesn't have any exposition to give, or any hope speeches to give, then she really doesn't have much of anything to say, which is a shame from a character who I'd ordinarily describe as incredibly passionate. But hey, Aang is actually having dialogue with these two chuckle fox. It only took until the end of the episode. Let's see what he has to say. I need to follow through on what they wanted me to do. Complete my training and master all the other bending skills so I can bring balance back to the world. Oh, you're gonna learn the other elements, are you, Aang? That's fantastic! I can't wait to see that. In fact, it seems like you've gotten over your apprehension towards being the Avatar altogether. That's great to see. I wonder why I'm focusing on this so much. So whatever, Aang gives his end of the episode speech, Zuko looks grumpy, and that's it. That's episode one. Just the first one. One hour of television and they crammed in that many issues. You could call this a rocky start. 
You could also call it the televised equivalent of a Diarrhea Sunday. It's no wonder that Bryke left the production of the show early on due to creative differences. I feel like I've been too harsh on them for Legend of Korra when something actually irredeemable pops up on my screen. So what's our verdict on the changes made from the original? I'm gonna say that every single one outside of Aang's conversation with Iroh was a complete misstep, and simply adapting the first three episodes one-to-one -one with a few tweaks for the sake of runtime or budget would have been much more beneficial. You could at least save Zuko's story in the Southern Air Temple for the next episode, which is what they do here anyway. That's enough time to fit the whole story of those three episodes into an hour's runtime, 20 minutes per episode, and it lets you continue with the narrative exactly as you need going forward since Aang going into the Avatar state here is what will drive the narrative going forward in this version anyway. None of the changes made were necessary for the sake of the adaptation into live action, or for the sake of the budget, or the new longer episode format, and in fact, I would say they overspent their budget on the wrong things. Genuinely, if I had to guess, I think the reason the Water Tribe looks better than it should is because they were worried if they adapted it too well, it would look cheap. But you should be jumping for joy at that notion. You get to be faithful to the original, tell a story environmentally, and not spend very much money all at the same time. Everybody wins. But hey, maybe this is just a rough start, and the show will get better from here. I'm sure it won't get even worse somehow. But covering everything wrong with the show is going to take way, way more time than I expected and am willing to edit in one sitting. I don't know if future videos on this series will be tackled one episode at a time. Some might end up being double features because there's a lot of redundant information that I can only say so much about. But maybe some scenes will be so insanely bad that I can talk about them for a fucking hour straight. Or maybe I'll just spend a lot more time talking about how good Avatar used to be before the streaming service is attacked. I'll tell you one thing, I have a much greater appreciation for the first season of Avatar now after watching this shit show. And I guess there's value to be found in that. The movie is still ass though. But we'll see how this mess goes from here. I can't wait to see how they handle the Kyoshi Warriors. I bet it'll be great. Oh no.